episode 220 of the podcast presented by Tick Pick. Very special guest on the show today. We got ESPN play-by-play voice, John Boog Shambi. John, uh, we just learned that baseball is back. Uh, you guys are going to be in the booth pretty soon. I know you're in New York City. How are you doing today? Doing well. How about you? Uh, not too bad. Not too bad. Hopefully getting back out to school in Phoenix in the fall in the next few weeks. We'll see where everything takes us. But again, it's been crazy times for just about everybody. I mean, I don't know about you. I know you guys did the uh, the Korean Baseball League, uh, that broadcast just a few weeks ago. How was that? Still doing it. Still doing it. Yeah, How- we're still doing it. It's, yeah, it's, I mean, it, I think on multiple levels, it's different. It's difficult. We, You know, we're getting up at 3 a.m. to do games at 5.30 and, you know, two, three times a week. And you're learning, you know, a, a group of players that you don't know And then from a technical standpoint, you know, it's akin to turning the volume down on a broadcast and just trying to do play-by-play. You have no idea when they're going to roll a replay, what graphics they may show, any of it. So you just kind of roll with it. I I said it's sort of like log rolling for three, three and a half hours. And then every once in a while, they throw me some chainsaws to juggle as well. How different is it from calling a major league broadcast? Like, did you, did any of their PR guys kind of like give you any tips or any other things that you didn't know going in? I, I would say that it, it's, it's the, the, here's where it's challenging is that there's that technical, I mean, I'm calling it on a 12 inch monitor. Yeah. So it's, that part's really difficult. So you don't see that well. And you're used to just being at the park and seeing from the view that you see from. And then there are these, you know, with the teams that I do, I know the teams very well. You know, the Yankees played the Red Sox. I don't need them even to have numbers on. I know the shapes and sizes of all the players. But with these guys, I don't know them. I'm not familiar with their names. So I think that it'll be a little easier when it's a major league game. But there's just there's a lot of different challenges with the KBO stuff, for sure. Well, you're definitely uh, keeping your reps up. You guys are definitely keeping your reps up. For you, as a broadcaster, again, I'm an aspiring young broadcaster. At what age growing up? Because I know you grew up in uh, the Philadelphia area on the East Coast. Yeah. For you, when did you realize that you wanted to be in sports media? Like, not necessarily as a broadcaster, because I know you wanted to be a talk show host as well. When did you know that you wanted to be in sports media in general? I, it's hard to say. I like playing. I mean, I always love baseball and always love sports, but I love baseball the most. And I went and played baseball at the College of William & Mary for a year, and then I transferred to Boston College and got involved with the student radio station there. I, I would say going into college, I knew that it was something I wanted to pursue. What actual, you know, discipline aspect of sports media, I wasn't entirely sure. I... I Felt like I was an informed sports fan. I had opinions. I liked researching. So sports talk was what appealed to me to begin with. I think I always had some idea that I would like play by play. Um, And I knew baseball was my favorite sport. So it just, it it kind of took shape as it went along. You know, when I first got down to Miami and did sports talk radio, I would go into an empty Marlins broadcast booth and do games into a tape recorder. And then eventually I got a good enough tape that I gave it to someone. They gave it to somebody who offered me a job in Boise, Idaho. And then I came back and I've just sort of been, you know, kind of climbing since. So what was your first official broadcast gig as a play-by-play guy? Well, I I mean, I did some in college, but not baseball. I mean, my first real play-by-play gig where they paid me for it was in Boise, Idaho. And I was 25 or 6. Wow. Wow. So for you now a veteran in this business, do you still before broadcast, I don't want to say get nervous because you probably don't get nervous, but do you get anxious before broadcast? Like you get excited, like you get ready to go. Like in a sense of like, again, not like nervous energy, but anxious energy. So I, I mean, I think that, you know, I'm human like everybody else. I think if, if I ever have anxious energy or anxiety, I think that where it's changed, thankfully, is is that shift from I'm always prepared, but mm-hmm. sometimes I get into the weeds of like the routine of what I go through to feel prepared. And there's a distinction there. You know, I do this and then this and then this and then this. And sometimes the time squeeze comes 
uh, and it makes it challenging. It's one of the things with the Korean baseball that's probably good for me is, you know, I like getting the lineups as early as possible so I can focus on those guys and the specific players. We don't get the lineups till 30 minutes before first pitch, and twice already we've had them call us 10 minutes to air and say, okay, so that game you were going to do, it got rained out. We're going to do a different <laughs> game. And I'm like, a different game? Yeah, you're going to do a different game. So you just kind of got to roll with it. But in terms of – I still get excited. I'm still excited, and especially the bigger the game, it's, it's exciting. It's fun. So in that sense, like you're, you could still say you're a fan of some sorts. When you were, Absolutely. When you were growing up, and I guess you got to be in this business – but you growing up, what do you think was your last, again, like don't want to say like non-baseball fan moment, but, but like your last fan experience where you were in the stands, like with your friends, just having a good time, and it was just a very memorable uh, moment at the ballpark? It's funny. I actually have an answer. I've, I've never been asked the question, and I have an answer to that question. Um, and it was in 2003 – the Marlins won the World Series, and it was – I was, you know, one of the radio broadcasters, and it was amazing. And in 2004, the Marlins ended on the match, and, um, but it wasn't looking great. And a couple of friends I went to Boston College with and a friend from home towards the end of the year said, hey, can you get playoff tickets for other teams? And I said, yeah. And they said, well, why don't you get us Red Sox playoff tickets? <laughs> so in 2004, I flew up to Boston. I didn't see the Ortiz walk off in the division series, but I flew up to Boston and was in the stands for game, game three, four, and five at Fenway Park. So I was in the park just with fans for the Robert Steele. Um, I was on green, the Green Monster for – game five, I had some guy run at me and just jump into my arms. And, and, uh, and then I was there for the first two games of the World Series when they broke the curse. It was a pretty, it was a pretty neat experience. I mean, I didn't grow up a Red Sox fan, but I could appreciate the pain and the suffering. And yeah, that was, I mean, it, that was, that was just there as a fan. It was, uh, but, and I was in, living in Miami, so I would fly up to go, just to go. So it was, that was, that's for the last time that I was there. And, and I was just with my boys, you know, and yeah, we, right. I mean, I'd been to, there have been in other sports, there have been, you know, other moments like that since, but baseball wise. Yeah. That was, that's the last real fan experience where, you know, we went there to game. I mean, game three, the Red Sox got their butts beat, yeah. and we left early. And so we were walking back to the hotel, and it was like every bar we stopped at, the Yankees just kept scoring. And, and then I think, I think game four, there was a rain out, and then they eventually played game four, and, we, and I stayed for four and five. It was amazing. Wow. So being back at Fenway as a broadcaster and looking back at that moment before they won the World Series in 04, is it a totally different atmosphere? Because every Sox fan I kind of ask is like, yeah, I mean, back then, like that Yankee-Red Sox rivalry when they were chanting 1918 all the time, right. totally different rivalry, totally different atmosphere. Well, again, remember, I, I've been there, you know, in 2003, we, the Marlins played the Red Sox at Fenway Yeah. Um, and broadcasted games there. And I would say that Besides the Miami stadiums, Fenway's probably the park I've done the most games in. Yeah. Um, but, yeah, it's changed. Uh, you know, look, it's an interesting one. I would say I, I think that that moment is one of the – I think the Red Sox, you know, ending the curse and doing it against the Yankees and doing it in the only experience any team has ever had coming from behind from 3-0 in baseball – I mean, it's one of the most significant moments in the history of the sport. And, and it also, I would say, at least for now, has adversely affected the rivalry. Because that pain that the Red Sox, when is this ever going to happen for us? Why does this team keep beating our ass? Right. It, it's, it's not the same. 
there's still an inferiority complex, but, you know, you're still talking, I mean, since 2004, the Red Sox, have, they won in four and seven and 13 and 18, you know, they won more than the Yankees. So, uh, so there's not as much pain there. So it's, it's a, and they've only played in the playoffs just the one time. Um, and that was uh, 2018. Right. So I, I, it's just not. Uh, so, so it was a significant moment that impacted how we going forward. So, right. In my yeah. opinion. For you, as obviously a big baseball guy, big baseball broadcaster, do you get the same um, type of adrenaline when you're calling different sports as opposed to baseball? Yeah, I think, I mean, the, the only two sports that I call mainly now are baseball and college basketball. Yeah. For college basketball, it's so energy yeah. dependent on the crowd. And the place I, that I do, you know, I do a non-conference schedule. Then I'm mainly, I've been in the Big 12. And Kansas is a place that I think is second to none. I don't even know, I don't know that, that I think Duke is even at the same level in terms of atmosphere that Kansas is. Uh and, and so, you know, you do those games and it's like you're conducting an orchestra. When Kansas is down a dozen in the second half and they get a steal and a dunk to make it 10, the crowd gets, you know, the good crowds aren't waiting for something good to happen. They're urging the team on to make it happen. And in Kansas, it's one of those things where they get the steal and the dunk to make it 10 and then they cut it to eight to six to four and then the three to take the lead. And then I can just shut up and just sit there and just like lay out and the crowd goes crazy. And it's like having a third person in the booth. Oh yeah. For you. Uh, and you talk about a third person. I've listened to a few of your interviews on some other podcasts. You prefer that three man booth on TV. Uh, what do you think makes that so different and kind of a different type of like versatile uh, team when it comes to three people as opposed to two in the booth? Yeah, I mean, I've changed. I, I, I'm talking about baseball specifically, but I just yeah. look at the amount of time you're being asked. The, the ball, the games are longer. The ball is in play less. There's more time between pitches. There's just more space. And at a certain point, do, I mean, do I think it's impossible for two guys to do it well? No, but I would say consistently at this point, you know, your standard game is going a really extended period and there's a lot of content space to fill. I, my opinion is that nowadays that in order to, to really capture and continue to deliver good content throughout a three and a half hour broadcast, you need more than two people. Right. Do you, do you have a preference over TV or radio? in your experience? They, you know, that's a question I get asked all the time. And I, and I think that for the guys that do both, they understand. I, I'm not copping out, but they, they both satisfy different things. Like with radio, the thing that I really love is I've done it so much. I love the combo of quickly and efficiently describing what's happening so you can really see it in your mind's eye. And when you're efficient with your words, engaging the analyst, and it's like, it's like packing a suitcase. Yeah. It's like putting, you know, it's like getting two weeks of clothes into an overnight bag, but, and doing it in the need, it's not, it's not bursting. It's done really neatly and everything fits in really nicely. And it takes a long time to be able to get to the place where you do that. Um, and the, look, in both sports, in both mediums, the big play is the big play. And then TV-wise, I still am calling the, you know, the, the plays, but, but content and uh, getting, you know, some of my nerd on is, uh, is a factor in, in, uh, in the TV landscape. Oh, yeah. Uh, so, and here's a question that I like asking broadcasters is, whether it was your time in college, just getting into it, kind of getting the rhythm down, whatever, whether it was recent, because it happens, we're human. What do you think your biggest broadcast blunder was on the air when it just came to like verbiage or something that you were just like, oh man, maybe I shouldn't have said that or something that you kind of just turned to your partner and was just like, man, that really screwed up there. Um, 
I don't know what to tell. I, it's, I mean, I, I say, look, there's a part of me. I, I don't think that everybody recognizes that if I, if I made you just sit and talk for three hours and 15 minutes straight, you'd say dumb shit. Right. It's it. So, and my goal is to try and not say dumb shit, but, <laughs> but to, to avoid it is challenging. So I'm going to make mistakes. I'm going to misspeak. I might present a point that's dumb. And I think usually when I do, I'm probably as close to the first to call myself out on it as anyone. Yeah. You try and make that the thing. You want to try and be, you know, as authentic as possible. So I don't, I don't have a specific, you know, blunder that, that comes to mind, to be honest with you. But I, I mean, I'll just, I'll just, spit, I'm, look, I'm comfortable. So at times I'll just spit stuff out off the top of my head. Right. That's dumb. Uh, <laughs> I mean, I, I, I try to avoid it. And, but um, I think you got to just be honest with yourself. And if you say something dumb, correct it. Or if you say something really dumb, just, you know, I'll, I'll sometimes I'll be like, I don't know why I just said that. <laughs> right. And how, how important do you feel, it is to, again, like everybody's got to be themselves. It's the only way you're going to be successful in any business, really, yeah. uh, yourself. But how important do you think it is kind of throwing in and mixing in your personality as opposed to kind of just going through the motions for anybody's sense? Like, yeah. That's like a big uh, mistake that young broadcasters make, trying to kind of emulate someone else and trying to be someone else rather than themselves. Yeah, but it's natural. And it's also – there are so many mechanical components to radio and TV right. that it takes a long while to get really comfortable with that stuff and the information and what's happening on the field to really let that stuff come out. The other thing is, look, whatever you want to say, baseball and baseball broadcasting is still – it's governed – in general, as a very conservative, white, older sport. Mm -hmm. And so even guys your age, you think about broadcasters, I think everybody gets into it and, and they just kind of, at least initially, start to drift towards trying to sound like a 65-year-old white guy. <laughs> and people, it's, you know, like, and using phrases that you just wouldn't use in everyday life. But until you get really comfortable with all the other stuff, I don't think it's so easy to, um, I don't think, I think it's easier said than done. I think it takes longer to really settle into who you are um, on the air. And I, so I, I think that, yeah, you want to be your authentic self, but it's not always so simple. Right. Were there any guys that you emulated growing up in college when you first started out? Anybody that you looked up to when you were a kid? I mean, look, I think growing up, I loved Harry Callis, who was the voice of the Phillies. He was the voice of NFL films. Um, you know, had one of the best voices of all time. I think we all want to be Scully. I've said that before. I think that every one of us wants to write verbal poetry. Right. And then we realize we don't have the, the source like vocabulary and you got to figure something else out. Everyone, you know, like John Miller. Yeah. John Miller can be Scully. I mean, that's just, he, he has that skill set and he can do it. But for most of us, we're not capable of that. So it just, you sort it out. And I know for me, it, it took, it took a long time. I mean, I'm 50 and I, you know, me as a broadcaster at 40, even I would say 35, I, I'm different than I, uh, than now. Right. And what do you, what would you say is the biggest critique or piece of advice that you got from a veteran broadcaster when you were first starting out? So the one that helped me the most was a mechanical piece of advice from John Miller. And that is, a mechanic talking about the mechanics of play by play on the radio and that you always want to say, here's the pitch before you think you do. Right. Because you want the space. So in terms of how it sounds like you can't say, here's the pitch in sync with the pitcher and create that space because the ball is going to hit the mitt and be faster than it coming out of your mouth. 
So as you're saying, here's the pitch, the TCH, the ball's hitting the bat. You hear it underneath, and that's not what you want. So you always, and then what it does is mechanically it sets you up to create the sounds um, so that you want to say it's just slightly ahead so that it's, here's the 2-2. Two, two. Here's the two two or here's the pitch, and the ball's hitting the bat underneath. You want you, you want it to be that um, you know space and segment, and you put yourself in so much of a better spot to. Uh, did I lose you there? We're good. You there? Good. So, based, so I guess the uh, the follow up question to that would be: What do you think is the biggest mistake that you've seen from young broadcasters today, whether it's on the mic or even like behind the scenes social media type stuff? I can't speak. You know, everybody social media. You know, do what you do. I'm older relatively seeking, so I'm probably going to say be more, you know, conservative. I don't think you want to get into fights with people on Twitter. It's not the place to try and convince or make your arguments. Um, I use Twitter as a place to get information and to play. I like being playful on it. I don't, I don't want to get into some type of serious thing. As far as, as, far as uh, mistakes guys make, I just think uh, start the play. I think that especially on the radio, it's – Start the play. Let me know the play is happening. I, I, you, I, I think that the, the way you get good at it is, is just get it to the basics. Like, stop trying to sound like something and tell me nine million things. Get me – when the pitcher has the ball on the mound and he's here, that's when I need you. So I don't want it to be we're having a conversation, there's a ball outside, and we keep talking foul back. And we're continuing to talk. That's in the dirt two and one. I, it's not like that. No, I want you to tell me. Here comes the two two outside. Right. Like I need. I you gotta, and and just do that. And it's like a building block. And that's your base. And if you can give me that each time, this is the play. The play is beginning. Swing and a ground ball to third. Pulled foul. Zero oh and one. And then. You know, do your stuff, put your shit in there. But then he gets back on the mound and then tell me the play is starting again. Right. Just give me that basic, just learn those basic things, the basic timing over and over again. And then you can do your stuff. Once you get that, you know, in baseball they talk about, uh, scouting-wise, they talk about this guy at shortstop. He got better at shortstop because his clock improved or a guy's good. His And what it is is it's just this internal thing that he knows how fast the runner is. Right. He knows how much time he has, depending on when the ball's hit to him, how much time to take. The broadcasters get that as well. Once you get your internal clock, you know, that's that's what happens. I'm sorry, we got sirens outside. <laughs> it's all good. It's New York City, baby. That is. What do you – What? who have you learned, I guess, um, more from – in your time broadcasting, a former or current veteran broadcaster or an analyst, someone who's actually played the game, like someone who you're in the booth with that is a, a 15, 20 year veteran who actually can relate to what's going on on the field? I don't know that I would say learn more from, I've learned the most just from doing it yeah. and finding my own path. I mean, I, like so many baseball people and analysts have taught me so much stuff. I, it'd be, be impossible for me to name all the, the smart ex players that have helped me understand things. And even still, I can't see all the stuff that they can see. Right. But, uh, and broadcasters as well. But I think it's just kind of a path. I, you know, you find your way, you find your own way. And how do you think developing those relationships with players uh, off the field was not only starting out, but like now as well. And do you have any uh, players that you kind of, I don't want to say favor more than others, but players that you've developed better relationships as opposed to others. I mean, it's just, it's crucial because you want to tell their story. Yeah. So I think that, 
of being curious and and connecting with guys is a huge it's what i miss now like that's the thing and when we do our the one thing i will tell you about so I'm not going to see people. And that's the thing. I miss that part, or I'll miss that part of it. You know, time way. Uh, yeah, you connect with people, and it's it's just for me, it's so important in order to uh, just learn who they are and 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 relay that stuff to the fans. Fans love it. You know. Do you have any like interesting or weird stories when it comes to players? Whether it was a good thing, like a good funny thing, or uh, a kind of uh, a story where it was kind of like they had to pull you to the side and say, like, why'd you say that on the air? I didn't, I haven't gotten a ton of that, you know, I, yeah. I, but I, you know, like a good example of like cultivating relationships. And then, you know, there's a story I told this one before where uh, I do a, a, a walk and talk segment, uh, 90 feet. And yeah. we were doing an angels diamondbacks game. And my producer called me and, or yeah, called me or texted me. What he texted me? What are you thinking for ninety feet? And I texted him back. I'm thinking about Tori Lavello. Um, and then he didn't text me back. And I, the next day, I was like, Al, ah, so I'll, you know, I'll, I'll, I'll hit Tori uh, because I know him. You know, pretty good relationship with Tori. At, you know, to set up the interview. And when I went to go text Tori, I realized that at 11 o'clock at night, I had sent Tori Lovello a text that said, I'm thinking about Tori Lovello. <laughs> so, you know, as soon as you see that, you're like, no! <laughs> you know, and you're, you want to take it back. And then, you know, I'm like, uh, Tor, sorry for the weird text, but my, I thought I was sending that to my producer. Wanted to see about... And then, so when I did the 90 feet, the last question I asked him was, what's the creepiest text you've gotten in the last six months? And he was just like, you know, and then we, <laughs> then we told the story on the air, you know? That's, so uh, what's that like? Obviously you got to ask for permission when it comes to stuff like joking around in the clubhouse. And then you're like, can I use that on air? And they're like, sure. Yeah. yeah. That's, and that's how you do. I think that's how you build trust. You know, I, when I was, one of the things I loved it and really got connected with Chipper Jones was he would let me use everything, but I'd ask, you know, mm -hmm. um, I talked to CC Sabathia the other day on the phone and he said to me when we were just chatting, he's like, if I was in my prime, he's like, I wouldn't play during COVID. Right. And so, and then I was on the air the next day and I texted him and I was like, can I use that? And he was like, absolutely. I watched Chipper Jones and John Smoltz play back him in one time and Chipper came roaring back from like way down, rolled double sixes like I don't know how many times in a row to beat him. And when he beat him, he was like, woo! And at the <laughs> end of it, I said, I've never seen you that emotional on the field. And he looks at me and then looks at John and looks back at me and goes, what can I say? He's my New York Mets. <laughs> That's and good. Right. And then I said, and then when he was done playing, I was like, can I say that on the air? And he's like, yeah. But like, there's stuff like that that I can't use. Right. But I would say that if you establish that level of trust, yeah. And so uh, you talked about emotion there a little bit. How, how do you think for you guys in the booth, as well as the players, are going to be able to adapt to having no fans at all in the crowd? It's just going to be empty. And for you guys in the booth, they're basically going to be able to hear everything that you guys have to say. Well, no, they're not because we're, I mean, number one, they're going to pipe crowd noise in, I think, to okay. every ballpark. So that's the one thing. And then when we're doing it, I'm going to be remotely located and they're only going to be able, there's only going to be the home team's broadcasters will be the only ones there, okay. even if you could hear them. So okay. I don't think that that's going to be, I think it's going to be weird. I mean, in the Korea games, uh, they have a cheer squad, which is odd, but they also pump in some crowd noise too. So it's just been different. I'd also say, you know, I broadcasted for the Marlins for eight years. I know what doing games with nobody in the stands is like. <laughs> fair enough, fair enough. So one last question before I let you go. I don't want to take too much of your time. Uh, but given all of your experience to this point, we kind of talked about what kind of makes a broadcast successful, what doesn't for young aspiring broadcasters as well. 
What do you think are the key components, though, to having a not only successful broadcast, but kind of an entertaining broadcast for the viewer? At the three notes I'm always trying to hit are interesting, smart, fun. That's it. That's what I'm looking to try and hit, those three. Interesting, smart, fun. So, um, you know, I'm not trying to turn it into math class as it relates to analytics, but I do want there to be smart stuff, and I want to get into topics that are interesting. Right. So that's really – that's it. That's what's in my head all the time when I'm doing the games. Want to have some, some fun. I like to play. I'm playful, smart, interesting. Those are the things. That's it. Well, you're keeping it interesting with the uh, KBO right now. Hopefully we'll get the, we'll, we'll see you in MLB in a few weeks. Again, the season starts in just 10 days. Yankees Nationals on national TV. John, thanks so much for taking time out of your day to talk to me here. And again, hopefully we hear you on the air in just a couple of weeks. All right, Jack. Thanks, man.